This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about social media use, mental health and anxiety recovery, and we have a special guest to help us with that, so let's get cooking. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is The Anxious Truth Podcast, episode number 191, 191, recorded in January of 2022. If you are new to the podcast, I am Drew Linsalata. I am creator and host of this fine show, the Anxious Truth is the podcast where we talk about all things anxiety and anxiety recovery. So if you're struggling with things like panic attacks, panic disorder, or agoraphobia, or any related conditions, this is the place for you. I'm really happy you're here. And of course, if you are a returning listener or a returning viewer, I'm certainly happy that you're here. Thank you for coming back every week. I appreciate that. Before we get on to our discussion, this week we're talking about social media, social media use, and how it impacts mental health and anxiety recovery. And I have a special guest to talk about it with that I know you guys are going to love. Uh, before we get into that, I want to remind you, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, that this is more than just a podcast. The Anxious Truth is more than just a podcast. There's a second podcast and morning email, little daily dose delivered into your mailbox in the morning, three to 500 word anxiety recovery lesson and a tiny little three to five minute morning podcast called The Anxious Morning, which is completely free. And everybody that's involved right now is loving the hell out of it. And I'm really enjoying doing that. You can find that at theanxiousmorning.com. And there are other things beyond this podcast. There is my social media presence, so if you're not following me on the social platforms, do that. And I'm also an author. I've written three books on anxiety and anxiety recovery, so I urge you to check those out as well. You can find everything at theanxioustruth.com, and you'll also find a way to support my work. If you like it and I'm helping you and you want to find a way to do that, just go to theanxioustruth.com slash support, and you can check all that out. So avail yourself of the resources, and as always, I appreciate any support that you offer, even if it's just cheering for me and rooting me on. Thank you very much. So that out of the way, let's get on to our discussion. We're going to talk about the use of social media and where it kind of fits, where there are pitfalls, which you got to be careful with as it relates to mental health and anxiety recovery. So let's get on with it right now. All right, here we are. Welcome back, peeps. For those of you listening to the podcast on audio, you got a whole intro. If you're watching on YouTube, you're just getting, you're getting the no frills version. <laughs> So to my right is my good friend and wonderful human being, Kimberly Quinlan. How's it going, KQ? What up? It's great. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here again. I know. It's always so much fun to have you. You did, or today we're going to talk about, oh, I have to say this for YouTube because you, you didn't get the intro. Today we're going to talk about social media and like mm -hmm. social media in relation to anxiety and anxiety recovery. Now, Kimberly mm -hmm. did one of the best 15 minute videos you're ever going to see on Instagram ever about this last week. I was literally fist pumping while I was listening to her and I'm like, all right, we're going to do a podcast on this. So, <laughs> so here we are. Let's talk about some of the stuff that you went over in terms of relating right. like social media use to mental health and, and recovery. Right. You made some tremendous points. Right. Well, the, the, the whole video was called the responsible use of social media. And so I had been thinking and reflecting a lot on social media and I had been observing my thinking about it, social media as being bad for me or bad in general. And then I started to really think about that social media is neutral, right? And how we consume social media is what kind of defines whether it's healthy or unhealthy. And then we can go from, once we, we, once we declare that, then we can start to explore how can I be responsible in my consumption of what is on the internet? Um, and when I talk about responsibility, I want to be really clear. Some people think that that sounds like a disciplinary word. Mm -hmm. And I love the word responsibility. I think it is one of the most compassionate words. It helps us to know that we are responsible for our mental health that it is our job to take care of ourselves, And that is the most self-compassionate thing you can do. And so uh, you can do this with any area of life, but please, I hope you do it with social media. Yeah, I love that. I think the idea of personal responsibility is very, there's tremendous power in that. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I get to do things. I get to have influence in this process. Mm, I choose. What do I choose? Yeah. And why am I choosing it? Sometimes I think along those lines, you know, and choosing what, how do I want to use social media? What is good for me? I think, ten, especially these days, people get caught up in the idea that, oh, no, 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 like, like scrolling Instagram all day because I follow 78 anxiety accounts. I, I have to do that. That's good for me. Not, no. not, so much, not necessarily, is it? 
Well, you know, I will speak personally. And one of the points that I will make here and I'll make it now is it, it, not everything is for you, right? Not every post is for you. Not every page is for you. And we have to really stop and consider what is for you. For me personally, I have, when I did this and I sort of really watched myself, I realized there are so many social media pages that are focused on mental health saying the same thing and it gets really noisy and it gets really like you you could leave feeling quite overwhelmed and confused because everybody's saying a version of a very similar thing that can be incredibly overwhelming i personally went through my whole social media account put a whole bunch of people on mute i, I don't i'm not saying i don't want to hear what they have to say but i'm being very intentional about what do I need to hear and what don't I need to hear? What's helpful? What's effective? And going from there has been really helpful. Yeah. You muted me, didn't you? you I know you I did. didn't. I did not <laughs> mute you. You are not muted, my friend. <laughs> I'm kidding. I thought about it. See, I thought I'm about mute. it. Every page I look at and I go, nope, this is, I'm not going to mute my friend, Drew. That's too funny. I love that. <laughs> That's such a good approach. Sometimes there are, it's so funny because there are days and it's so meta, which really? My phone is making noise. Okay. Oh, well, I'll have to make noise. Um, like an intrusive thought. Yeah, it's totally an intrusive thought. It shouldn't be doing that. Oh, and it's a timer that I said. You know what this timer is? It's <laughs> going to do this. Oh, God. This is so ridiculous. Hang on. This is going to get me. You just <laughs> behind the scenes. Yeah. It is, this it is. is life, right? This is yeah. life. So one of the things that's kind of weird addressing social media use is there have been times when I have said, hey, here's an idea like on Instagram. In my stories, I'll say, why don't you just like unfollow all of us for today, just for a day and try it. And then come back tomorrow if you think you have to. And invariably it'll generate like a bunch of responses like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. Like, yeah, but you didn't unfollow me to tell me that. So it's such a weird cycle, but I think it's a great idea sometimes to say, yeah, I'm just going to pare down a little bit, or maybe I'm going to rotate people. I'm going to follow my five favorite accounts this week. And then I'll rotate to five different ones next week because the tidal wave. It's a yeah. tidal wave. If yeah. you're not kidding. That's overwhelming. Here, here, here is the truth. Here is the truth. I'll be very transparent about my experience. Is I have a social media page. I am very invested in growing my page. Mm -hmm. I have learned a lot from professionals in this area. And they basically say, go for things like lists. Go for things like symptoms. Go for things that are spicy. And... I was listening and going, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, I'll do those things. And then I started to realize I'm doing exactly what I should do to grow following, but this is not in the service of people who are in recovery. And I had to own that. I had fallen into the trap of algorithm hunting. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, and I'm not saying any account is bad, any account. I'm not, I wouldn't even, I can't even come to mind with someone I'm thinking about as I say that. But you have to understand that as a consumer and me as a consumer, I have to understand that the the clickbait, the the lists and all those things, they're very validating, but they can form as a form of reassurance, which keeps you stuck. It feels helpful. It feels beneficial. It feels like you're gaining knowledge. And for a lot of people, this is where I say some posts are really helpful depending on where you are in recovery. If you're new to this idea and you're learning about it, that can be so helpful to realize like, oh, I have depersonalization. Like so, so many people, my best post is on depersonalization and people say, I had no idea what that was. But then if you're seeing these posts repetitively, they do start to be a form of reassurance. And so the one of the main points I made in that video was really take into account that each post is not specifically for you and question and consider whether this is keeping you in a cycle of reassurance. Now, I'm not saying that to freak everybody out and feel like, oh, no, now I'm like using a social media as a compulsion. I do, I'm not saying that any of this is going to be bad or devastating. It's just something to think about. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of it is how do you really feel when you're done with the doom scroll? or mm -hmm. that you feel compelled to go back to it. Every hour yeah. I got to scroll for 10 minutes. That kind of says something. And honestly, just to follow up on the point, and I, look, I've been there. I'm in the business here and to a certain extent. And the advice 
I, I know how to get followers if I want them. I know how to get likes and comments if I want that. But the platforms that we operate on, and I'll Instagram, we're on together all the time. So I'll call it Instagram, but they're all the same, are not operating yeah. based on what's best for you. Mm -hmm. They are operating based on how can Drew and Kimberly keep your attention is what that's what the platforms are there for. We exist for Instagram so that we can keep your attention and keep you on the app. But that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with helping in your recovery or providing mm -hmm. you with valuable information or guidance. So it, that just keep that in mind as you're scrolling, 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 scrolling and liking, liking, liking. There's a reason why you keep liking the same messages again and again and again. Right. The folks at Instagram, I'm going to go all evil empire, are like, whoa, ha, 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 we got them. <laughs> in a way, you know, there's a reason why those posts keep you coming back again and again and again. Mm -hmm. But I also think that you have to recognize that this is not necessarily a tool that's geared toward my recovery. This is a tool geared to keep my attention. And in the end, it means that sometimes as a content creator, you create content that I know is going to be like crickets, but it's the most valuable content you create. I'm sure you mm -hmm. can appreciate that. I do. I really, really, and I respect you for it, right? I had to make a decision. I remember you and I having a phone call and we were saying like, I think I was like in the line at in and out or something. And I, and I, I think I messaged you and I said, kill me if I ever point at things, right? <laughs> oh, the pointing reels? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure I've done some pointing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with pointing, but I think the thing to remember, and here's where I would bring to the point is, to be honest, when I am on social media, I am providing psychoeducation. But think about psychoeducation in the context of me as a clinician. I do a ton of psychoeducation at the beginning of treatment, and then we don't go back. We move on to behavior change. And so when you're on Instagram, you are consuming education, but the real good stuff happens in the behavior change, right? And that happens off social media and i love how we you were talking and i and i made the point too is track your time if you are finding that you're uncomfortable and you're picking up your phone to manage you're going to you're trying to access psychoeducation and that's actually not a great management tool a really great management tool is behavior change right or coping strategies or whatever it is that you're learning at that time but but the actual learning the, the act of learning isn't isn't a recovery uh, behavior that I would encourage a lot of. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I love how you pointed that out. Like the psychoeducation part is only maybe not even half. In the beginning, it's probably 80% of it because you don't you go in not knowing anything. But then that percentage yeah. gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the action actually starts to matter more than anything else. Yeah. And I will tell you as a content creator, in all honesty, content that, that I create that speaks directly to behavioral change just craters algorithmically. It's yeah. not good. It yeah. doesn't get attention. It does not. But if I post five reasons that anxiety is scary, I'll get a thousand likes on that in two hours. I get that. Yeah. So keep that in mind as you're using it. I want to go over. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to mention too, is I have found that sometimes social media becomes a surrogate for the action. Mm -hmm. And people will think, well, I follow all the accounts. I like everything. I comment, I watch all the videos. So I'm doing recovery. Right. Yeah. Are you? Well, I think it's the same as have being in therapy, right? Is I, I often have to have conversations with patients of you coming to therapy isn't actually, it's one hour of a week. It's actually not going to create a lot of change in your life. So saying you're in therapy isn't, isn't, it's, it's important. It's so important. But the real change is on four o'clock in the afternoon when you do something to face your fear. It's the homework you do. It's it's the actual work. And so I agree with you is um, following social media accounts, particularly mental health ones, doesn't mean anything about recovery. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even put them in the same category. I, I consider them as as a way to get information. But no. then the real change is you in that moment facing your discomfort or writing it out. That's a mic drop right there. That's, that is really good advice. That's worth the price of admission right there, folks. Write that down. <laughs> um, so two things I want to pop in on really quickly, I guess. And we talked about this before we went on the air. So Kim already kind of knows, but you had, you talked in a video about not everything is for you. I love not everything is for you because I, I think what winds up happening is I, I made the, the, I made the, the, I the, brought that into the meds discussion, discussion of medication or not medication. And we have this thing that 
we also use the social media scroll, the doom scroll to validate our choice and confirm our, our recovery choices or confirm that we are where we're supposed to be. So in a conversation about using medication to, to handle anxiety, people who don't use it feel compelled to roll in to remind everyone in that conversation that they don't use meds. Mm -hmm. In a conversation, and this is just a, an example, I'm not picking on specifically meds, a lot of different things. In a conversation about not using meds, people might be discussing that and people who are on medications will have to roll in and declare, there's no shame in using meds. When in reality, if you look objectively at the conversation, that conversation wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't invalidate your choice. So sometimes we see things on social media that don't jive with the way we're doing recovery or the way we're taking care of ourselves, but maybe it wasn't for you and you're not right. obligated to jump in and get into the fray to defend your position or validate right. your position. I think that sometimes can be really harmful and I see it a little bit too often, I think. Well, and I think that the question to maybe ask yourself as you're going on is, why do I feel such an urgency to to defend my decision, mm -hmm. right? Because not everything is for you. And I, I, I say it over and over, like not everything is for you. You know, meds can be really helpful for some people. The reason I brought that up is I get asked every single day on social media about medication. Mm -hmm. And I always say, please, please, please do not ask anyone on social media about medication or medical health that's just a very that's the most compassionate thing you can do because the people you're asking number one aren't professionals number two don't know specifically your genetic makeup your height your weight your pre-existing conditions yeah. and so even the conversation around medication i usually just I don't shut it down in like a in a way that's shaming. I more want to frame it as please don't talk about a medication on social media because they don't know the totality of you. They don't understand the many, many things that are needed to to go into that decision. And the people coming in being defensive don't know that person's totality of what makes them up and what's important to them. So I think it's the kindest thing we are we've gone so far in social media and in the internet expressing our opinion mm -hmm. and i want to kind of bring us all in a rein us in a little and remind ourselves social media and the internet is awesome you can find any answer to any question but be skilled in the answers the questions you're asking yeah right it, it's be be wise and compassionate in the discussions you're having, identifying first that what was right for you is not right for other people. Yeah. And why do I feel so strongly about defending my position or, or mm -hmm. rebutting an alternative position? And I think social media, you're right, has conditioned us, the royal us, to say, oh, no, no, we have to be right. And we need to make sure mm -hmm. we're heard. We don't always have to be heard. I'm not telling anybody yeah. to sit down and shut up ever. But are those conversations productive for us or not in a mental health right. standpoint? Do I want to go right. and argue about medications or types of therapy or whatever? It doesn't matter. Uh, meds right. was just an example. I wasn't picking on that particular topic. No, I think it's true of so many things. It, even, even again, in the mental health space online, it could be around a different modality than CBT, right? So someone might say meditation was so helpful for me. And someone would say, no, meditation made it so much worse for me or whatever it may be. And these are healthy discussions. I applaud people for having them. But where I really wanted to educate was as you're reading and observing or engaging in these conversations, just keep in mind that not everything is for you and not everything is for them. Yeah. It's very personal. It's really, it's a really good point. It's a really important point. So... I mean, I loved, you know, you did talk about being a, a critical consumer of information. I think it's really important for us to also understand, not only can you get any answer to any question, you can get any answer that you want <laughs> for any question also. Don't you love that? Don't you that, love is, that? that is really also, and I think very important in this situation, because I think that whole thing where like social media becomes a surrogate for the actual reaction of recovery for some people, yeah. and look, it's an easy mistake to make, I'm not blaming anybody. It's, it's much easier to scroll than it is to do your ERP homework. Much easier. I get that. Mm -hmm. 
But when you are looking for confirmation of something that says, well, this will give me a break, or I really want that to work. I don't want ERP to work because it's really hard and scary. I want this to work instead. If you go looking for confirmation that the other thing will work better, you will, in fact, find it. You can yes. confirm anything on the internet if you look hard enough. I know. So, if, yeah. if I'm in a fight with my husband and I want to make my point, I can Google it and show him. You will 100% make your point. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind. And then when he wants to prove you wrong in return, it'll take him six minutes tops. I know. I know. Yeah. So, no, I think I think that okay. So let's sort of talk. I always try to like bring it back to like real life. So yeah. in real life, yeah. often once I've seen a patient for a while, they will start to say, "Okay, so what about this one situation? Like, what do you think?" And I annoy them by going, "What do you think I'm going to say?" Right? Because I don't want them to be going con constantly requiring me as an authority to tell them. I want them to start to inquire for themselves. Okay, what are the pros and cons of this behavior? Is it effective? Is it short term beneficial or long term beneficial? And so that they're starting to be able to critically analyze behaviors because, again, everybody is different. And so that's what I would ha say to a lot of people is if you're going on to ask a question, it's f fine to go on for education, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I want you really just to be honest. This is, the, like I said, the responsibility piece. Be really compassionately honest with yourself. Like, is this for me just to relieve myself of my urgency here? Would this strengthen that muscle that I'm trying to strengthen of being uncertain and, and you know, willing? Like, have some really, I love questions. Ask yourself some really good questions. And is this effective? Have, do I notice a trend of me doing this? You know, when I'm doing this, is there a sense of me like, you know, if then statements, like if I just do this, well, then I'll have this thing and then things will feel better. And so I think that that check in can actually help us to make, you will probably find you didn't need Instagram at all. Right. I love that. You, yeah. That's good. Like, why, why do you want to ask that question? Or why do you hmm. want to research this thing? Right. Hmm. Or why are you picking up your phone? Yeah. It's just the act of being on social media to avoid the discomfort that you feel right now. Right. And I, I want to say I do it too. Like, I, please, please do not do yeah. not think I'm coming from any kind of like mastery over this. This is just questions that are fun to ask that sometimes the answers aren't fun to hear, but it can help you to be a really, you know, effective consumer on the Internet. I think this even goes, I mean, well beyond just mental health and recovery too. Everybody has, I don't say everybody, I can't say everybody, but it apparent that it runs rampant, at least in the Western world now. And I find saying, I'm walking through my house. I said this to somebody just not too long ago today. I'm like I, the other day I was walking through my house and I asked myself, why on God's green earth am I walking through my house with my phone in my hand? What what is the purpose of having my phone in my hand going between the dining room and the living room? I don't understand. Well, What's you take a tea with in the bathroom. I'm always like, what? Why, why do I have this thing in my hand? What is going to happen in this magical rectangle of light that is so important between one room yeah. and the other in my house? Everybody has these issues. We all yeah. have these issues in this age. So these are hard things yeah. to confront sometimes. I want to ask you one more thing before we sort of wrap up, I guess. In a therapeutic environment, forget pre-internet, right? There's no internet. Somebody comes in and they engage you and they're six, seven weeks, whatever, into it. And they begin to ask, okay, well, what about this modality? What about this alternative treatment? What about this? I mean, I understand that stuff is natural and you should be able to bring that to your therapist or, or to whoever's your helper. I get that. Isn't that wrong with the question? But you might be able to answer it a certain way or guide them to their own answer. The mm -hmm. internet makes that question askable every minute of every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. So how would you advise one, just so I guess this is a personal opinion is clearly this is not therapy. We know this, these videos are not therapy and Kimberly cannot be your therapist on YouTube, but what would you advise a client to do in that situation? When the going gets right. rough, are you going to say, you know what, commit to this for X amount of time. You're going to have to leave the other stuff around. You can always revisit it if it's, this isn't working for you. But mm -hmm. for now, we need to have a focus on this modality for now. Is yeah. that a thing? Or it is no, I actually I supervise all of my staff. And this was actually a case that we recently went over 
is so the way that I do it personally, and every clinician is going to show up a little differently, but I try not to ever assume that I am the authority on anybody. Um, except my husband, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ouch. Just kidding. <laughs> it's a tough I'm role. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But so, so I'm going to with a client is I'm going to first just give them the science, right? Because there, you know, I think it's our job. My job ethically is to provide scientific gold standard treatment, right? That is my, I took an oath to to be on the right side of ethics. I, you know, I, I took an oath that when I show up and if there's a client that I'm not skilled at seeing that I refer them out. Mm -hmm. So I am going to explain to them the science and why, and that's an important point is I made this mistake when I was an intern is I went straight in, started doing the tools and I did not explain why we were doing it. And the client fully melted down, right? Like had no, like, why are you making me do all this crazy stuff? And, and I hadn't done enough education and enough mm -hmm. of the explanation of the science. So I'm going to explain the science. I'm going to ask and prompt them a lot of questions. Like what about that is, you know, really magnetically pulling you in. And we might even explore if there is a trend happening. Oh, that one seems to have really quick results, right? Like, Oh, the hypnotherapy, I heard it's two sessions, so I'd be done. And okay, do you find that there's a trend where you're you're engaging in behaviors to get fear to go away really quick? And we might may be curious about that. At the end of the day, if they're adamant about trying it, I don't stop them. I don't, because for them, and this is true for me, it's true for all humans, is I think sometimes we need to see the same pattern play out before we are motivated to make change, right? We have, we, things have to not work a certain amount of times before we go, wait a second, right? Like if my son's playing a game on the carpet and something doesn't work, he'll do it again and he will do it again and it won't work. And at some point he's going to go, okay, this is not effective. Something is wrong. I'm going to have to ask for help. And so I think sometimes we do need to let them learn by repetition, but I, I can't stop anybody. And as a clinician, my job is not to ever pressure somebody into doing something they don't, don't want to do. Yeah. Or dictate that. But yeah. you know, the, the internet, social media makes it infinitely askable all the time. Is there a better way? Is there a better mm -hmm. way? Is there a better, you can ask that every minute of the day and find a better way every minute of the day. So yeah. That's another thing to be mindful of. Like, mm -hmm. am I continually looking for a better way every day? Yes. Again, back to the economy of attention. It's an attention economy. I know you've heard those sort of things before. Like, yeah, if, you, if you're going to seek out a social media source that is a different modality of treatment or a different way to approach mm -hmm. your anxiety problem, they have a vested interest algorithmically to convince you that you should listen to them, whether it's appropriate mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind. So I think yeah. you have to... Also look for the people I think who are going to not insist that you, all right, if you don't disagree, if you disagree with me, there's the unfollow button. Go ahead. I'm not for you. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's, so it's important to be able to do that. Not yeah. And I think, follow me, it's the, okay. yeah, it's, I've had clients who have brought things like that up. I read on the internet or there's this one program online that was really cheap and said that they would give me a hundred percent guarantee. And sometimes when I just talk through and go, yeah, it, it makes total sense that that those types of products would be seem so um, magnetic, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we just sit in, like, yeah, it makes total sense that the, you know that sounds good. Um, often they don't purchase those products and go to those. They just needed to be validated, right? They yeah. just needed to be like. Yeah, you know, I, if there were solutions, quick solutions to problems, I, you know, I, that makes total sense. It, they just kind of wanted to air it out. Yeah, it makes sense. And that's a conversation you can have with your therapist or a trusted advisor or a friend or, or a partner in life or whatever it is. It's mm -hmm. hard to have that discussion on the internet. It's, yeah. So just be wary yeah. of having it. This was so great. Anytime we get to chat, I'm, I'm a happy guy. So Thank you have anything you, you, you want to add to this at the end? No, I think um, keep track of your time is one thing I would mention in terms of just, I would actually encourage you to jot down when you pick up your phone, 
um, keep a track for a day or two, you'll be shocked at how many times. I think your phone can actually tell you that too now. Screen time widget on an iPhone is yeah. life changing. Because yeah. if you put that widget on your home screen, you will be mortified. Yeah. And then the only thing I would really just really push is your mental health is your responsibility. It's your job. Um, I'm not saying that it's only your job and that you're alone, but try to really play around with the idea that this is my opportunity. It's my, it's my option. It's my choice. Even though that at the beginning is like, oh, I don't like the sound of that. It actually can be really empowering because then you've actually like, oh, yeah, it is my choice. I have more agency than I thought I did. Yeah. And so I would just play around with really taking responsibility for the things in your life and whether they're effective or not. It can change the game, in my Kimberly. opinion. Yeah, I'll put a cap on that. And I'll use Kimberly as an example because her content is tremendous. That's that thing that says, well, I'm going to ask for recovery in the comments section on Instagram. Your responsibility is to go beyond that. Nobody can tell you recovery in the comment section anywhere on Instagram or otherwise. But you have in front of you a resource that has put out years of free psychoeducation that's incredibly valuable. So be responsible and say, I will go and avail myself of this resource that has been handed to me, as opposed to please just, just hand me what I want right now. Yeah. What do they think right. to me the most po powerful ways you can use social media is to say, Hey, this looks like a really interesting post. Instead of going into the post to try and see if this will be my recovery, let me explore what else this person has and invest mm -hmm. some time and ingest some information because there's yeah. so much good stuff there. There really is. So Yeah. Thank you. You too. You yeah. too. I still have such respect for all the content you create. Oh, thank you. You're very sweet. Uh, anyway, how can people find you? You can... Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Your Anxiety Toolkit. You can listen to my free podcast at Your Anxiety Toolkit. Um, or you can get a ton of free resources or courses at cbtschool.com. I highly recommend it. Those courses are tremendous. I can say Thank that you. firsthand. Yeah. So Thank you. Kim, I appreciate you coming as always. Thank you for having me. All right. See you guys next time. If you're listening, I'll come back and wrap this up. If you're watching, we're done. <laughs> see you all next time. Alrighty, then we are back in the studio, which is the same desk I was sitting at not five minutes ago talking with Kimberly. That is episode 191 in the books. I hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to my friend Kim Quinlan for coming by again, you could find her at your anxiety toolkit on Instagram and her website at cbtschool.com. You should go check it out, support her work too, because it's excellent. And she's just a good human being. And that is it. I will play you out as always with Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. There it is. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Go check him out and tell him I said hello. And if you are watching the podcast on YouTube, please like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or some platform that lets you leave a rating and a review, leave a five-star rating, write a little review. It helps other people find the podcast. And that's why I do this to help as many people as I can. That is it. Thanks for coming by. We will see you again next week. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but we're going to be here. So come on back and remember... This is the way. Yeah, you're on your way. It's in the afterglow. It's in the lyrics of the songs we know. It's in these feelings that you never show.